The search for the next BBC Cardiff Singer of the World began last year. This is not just a local competition in Cardiff, this is a worldwide event. We are constantly looking for new operatic stars to feed the operatic system. Everyone in the business knows that it's one of the most important competitions in the world. It's a big title. And to have that name attached to yours, I wouldn't mind it. Over 400 young opera singers entered, with 52 selected for auditions around the world. We're always looking for the best possible candidates. Those voices that, you know, give you that tingle that you think, oh, this is a different voice, this is a special voice. In this, the competition's 30th anniversary year, 20 of the world's best young singers have made it through to compete in Cardiff. All of them hoping to lift the Cardiff Singer Trophy and take their place on the distinguished list of winners. BBC Cardiff Singer of the World really launched my career. Winning that competition was a very special moment for me. It actually changed my life. It's where everything started. And we are still counting. This is a celebration of 30 years of BBC Cardiff Singer of the World. In 1983, the pound coin was first introduced in the UK. Margaret Thatcher was returned to power on a wave of post Falklands patriotism. And music entered the digital age as CDs hit the shops for the first time. In Cardiff, a new world-class concert hall opened its doors. Keen to take advantage of the new St David's Hall, BBC Wales producer Mervyn Williams came up with the idea of an event to show off the hall to the world. I thought of this idea of having a competition. I thought it came from a Welsh background of the Eisteddfoda and so on. I thought, yes, that might work. To make his idea happen, Mervyn joined forces with Welsh National Opera and Cardiff City Council. But he would also need the help of broadcasters from around the world to find the singers. I was head of music in the Finnish broadcasting company TV1 and Mervyn Williams came to a meeting and he said to us that we are going to establish a competition in Cardiff, would you be interested in that? And I remember that we were two countries, Belgium, Edis Taylor from Belgium and myself who immediately said that yes, we are in and that's how it started. Broadcasters from 18 countries sent singers to Cardiff. For me to be invited to a BBC singing competition was like a lottery win for a young singer. It was like a dream. I was just excited about everything. I was 18 and um, I just really started taking singing seriously. Thought in terms of making a career out of it and I was chosen and, um, and off I went. Chaired by the legendary Welsh baritone Sir Geraint Evans, an international panel of singers and industry professionals was assembled. And so Cardiff Singer of the World was born. You never know what to expect with a new competition, but there'd been a lot of, uh, a lot of thought put into this one. There was a lot of excitement, a lot of talk had been going on, you know, for a couple of years leading up to the actual event. So, you know, the air was kind of full of feeling that this was going to be an important new televised competition. From the start, the competition set out to find the opera stars of the future. The entrance included an 18-year-old mezzo-soprano from Ireland named Patricia Barden. I mean, I didn't have any expectations. I was completely naive, for sure, perhaps even... <sighs> Made one of the first times I'd sung with a symphony orchestra easily. Yes, 
What we weren't sure about was what allowance we would have to make for experience versus promise. In fact, it didn't work out that way because it was the youngest voices, as it turned out, who had the most extraordinary artistic maturity. Donna Anna's or Saiki Lonore. Oh my God, I must. <laughs> I was so bold. It's a question of showing your potential. Maybe singing an aria that you wouldn't be ready to sing the whole part, but showing the way your voice might develop in the future. The entire role would have killed me, but uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Luckily, I only needed to sing the aria, and I won. <laughs> Carita just had it all, uh, even at that age. She had a poise, she had a, an exquisite voice. You could see already the talent and the energy and personality were there. Although I think she would admit that she wasn't a fully formed singer when she won it, she turned out to be one of the outstanding singers of our age. Carita Matala's win helped Cardiff Singer declare itself to the world. The competition was a huge success and would return two years later. <laughs> Then the title went to the American baritone, David Malice. He was followed in 1987 by Italian coloratura soprano, Valeria Esposito. But it was another performance that year that started the competition organizers thinking. The performance of leader or art song alongside operatic arias had been part of the competition since it started, but a performance by Finland's Soile Isakoski helped convince the organizers that a separate leader prize should be awarded at the next competition. What couldn't have been predicted was the drama that would unfold during the 1989 final. Local boy Bryn Tarevel was up against unknown Russian Dmitry Vorostovsky in what became a battle between two baritones. Everyone talks about Dmitry Vorostovsky and Bryn Tarevel. That evening was incredible. You had two absolutely outstanding talents. I mean, they were so young. Those were giant talents. It was really a remarkable occasion, and I felt it was a moment of history. I'm sitting with Elizabeth Zoderstrom, the great Swedish soprano, and on stage comes this Russian baritone, looking sensational. And I look over at Elizabeth, and on her pad of paper, she puts an exclamation point as soon as he walks out. <laughs> By the time he'd finished, her page was full of exclamation points. And this first time of hearing that voice singing a piece which suited him really well was a real thrill. The way Dimitri handled the Verdi was masterly for a young boy. I mean, quite unbelievable. What Forostovsky had and still has is that wonderful, velvety, Russian sound that can spin long lines in Verdi and give the sort of dark brooding quality to Tchaikovsky. Dmitri had incredible star quality, which he still has, but um, so did Brent. <laughs> He was brimming with talent in a most extraordinary way, and it wasn't as refined quite yet. He has the hard to quantify but easy to recognize qualities of a superstar singer. You know, he has extraordinary dramatic intensity, 
uh, theatrical charisma, he makes audiences love him. And he had that from, from the first day. I, I imagine that he opened his mouth. <laughs> The thing that always amazes me about Britain is the focus on the delivery of the text. The way that he performs the meaning of every single phrase that he sings with extraordinary intensity and, and nuance. When you hear Bryn singing Wagner particularly and you get the intensity of delivery, uh, then you realize what a precious thing that is. I think I gave Dimitri a 9.85 and Brynn a 9.8. It was so close that it was a hair. The winner is Dmitry Havarskovsky. Brynn may have been pipped at the post by Dmitry, but it was a battle that's become part of Cardiff singer folklore. To have those two baritones competing in 89 was sure to put Cardiff Singer on the map. 1989 was a remarkable year for Cardiff Singer. Dimitri taking the main prize and Bryn establishing the credentials of the leader prize in its first year. It's continued as a highly valued part of Cardiff Singer ever since. It's a much more refined atmosphere of making music when you, you have the intimacy of a piano and just the singer standing there, there's nowhere to hide. It gives a different aspect of the singer's art, really. You know, I mean, it's the same voice, but it's a different approach. Song needs a different sort of communication. You have a different interaction working with piano than with full orchestra. And that is a very intimate relationship. You've no costumes, you've no set to hide behind. It's all you, it's the words, it's the text. It's a different animal. You can be a lot more subtle with it. You could sort of add a lot more colors because you're, you're not singing over a full orchestration. The world of arias tends to be exploring emotionally extremes. I'm so terribly happy, I'm so terribly sad. My lover's just died, I'm about to die. Uh, song is often about uh, less extreme things than that. It's a part of me. I'm doing both concerts and uh, recitals and, and opera, so it's natural to do both. I think it's fantastic that Cardiff Singer has this separate song prize. An opera singer should study and sing the song repertory because the attention to musical nuance and colouring that you need to work on in miniature in a song is what also helps make special a, a performance um, in opera. Song repertoire presents very specific challenges for the singer, and in some instances, it puts the accompanist under enormous pressure too. Ingrid Surgeon had played for me, and that was wonderful. This was the first time we had done something major together, and then, of course, what did I do but, but say I was going to be singing Schubert's El König, which is a graveyard for many, many accompanists. It's a difficult piece. It's like it's like running a marathon, you know? You've got to do a lot of, of warming up beforehand, you know? It doesn't just happen just like that. It's really complicated. Their performance must have impressed the jury that year as Neil walked away with 1991's Leader Prize title. The main prize that year went to Australian Lisa Gastine, who went on to become one of opera's great Wagnerian sopranos. The Brits have never done specially well in winning the main prize at Cardiff, but have been dazzling in the uh, song prize, where they are second to none. We had famously Bryn, but also from Wales, Neil Davis, 
are Chris Maltman, representing the Baritones of England, Andrew Kennedy, um, Elizabeth Watts is a soprano, and then I think we can count as an honorary Brit, Eilish Tynan, representing Ireland, but I think we have to include her in this. Very popular choice indeed. In a move to improve the overall standard of the competition, 1993 saw the introduction of worldwide auditions. No longer would singers be selected for Cardiff by their country's broadcaster. It would also be the first year that the competition would be won by a singer that didn't win their round. Inga Dam Jensen. I was really, really surprised, and I'm sure everybody could look at me and see that was how I felt at that time. <laughs> Listen to that crowd. She was absolutely fantastic. You have to hand it to her. I was in a kind of shock afterwards. Winning that competition changed my life, I would say, and it changed my career. I had to make some choices, actually, which way I wanted to go. Ten years after Inga's win, Finnish baritone Tommy Hackler, who also failed to win his round, took the main prize. The next couple of months were like crazy, actually. I don't think I have ever given that much interviews in my life. This news that I won that competition was brought in everywhere here. And then came the invitations to auditions and next two, three years were quite fast, full booked. Both singers returned home to take lead roles at their national opera houses. There are two different ways of running operas, buying all the soloists for, the, for that production and then the other soloist for the next and so on. Or then, then there are these houses uh, where they have a fixed ensemble. So that means that you have every kind of voices in the house regularly monthly paid. This is my fifth season here in the ensemble of the Finnish National Opera. One of the reasons were that I could extend my repertoire a little bit, getting the shorter but heavy Wagner roles and one level more heavier Verdi stuff. It's been very good experience. After her win in Cardiff, Inge Dam Jensen returned to Copenhagen to develop her career with the Royal Danish Opera. I was really lucky to get all the roles which were perfect for me to begin my career. I have a, a contract with Danish National Opera. It's 15 performances, which means about two or three productions a year. In her time in Denmark, Inge has taken on a long list of operatic roles and has also become a sought-after performer on concert stages around the world. I love concerts and I do that as much as I can. It's shorter periods and I can be with my children here, so that's, that's a good combination for me. Both Inge and Tommy continue to perform both in their home countries and internationally. The success of Nordic singers in Cardiff continued in 1995 when Sweden's Katarina Karnaeus won over the jury and the St. David's Hall audience. The prize went further afield in 1997. With China becoming a hothouse for operatic talent, it was no surprise when Guang Yang became the country's first Cardiff singer winner. 1999 saw the title back in European hands, with the prize going to German soprano Anja Hatteros, now one of the world's biggest stars. <laughs> 2001 was another year for firsts. Romania's Marius Brenciu became the first winner of both the main prize and the song prize, and was also the first tenor to lift the trophy. The 20th anniversary of the competition in 2003 was marked by some major changes. The Leader Prize was renamed the Song Prize and established as an event in its own right. 
Then there was a new audience prize, offering those at home and in the hall a chance to pick their favourite from the week. Chilean soprano Angela Marambio took home the inaugural award. And long-serving jury member Dame Joan Sutherland was honoured with a new title, that of the competition's first patron, a role she would continue in until her death in 2010. In 2005 saw Nicole Cabell wow the jury to become only the second American to claim the Cardiff Singer title. BBC Cardiff Singer of the World really launched my career. You know, right afterwards it was just a tidal wave of attention and media and roles being offered both, both appropriate and inappropriate. The pressures that came after the competition were probably the most difficult psychologically. It was not only a choice between what roles do I sing, but how often do I sing? Joan Sutherland gave me the advice, don't do too much too soon. But every once in a while I did just a little bit too much. It got to me I needed more time for vacation, for rest, and ultimately for preparation. And this is what kills us young singers, right? We need time to really put a role in our voice. Nicole has graced the stages of many of the world's leading opera houses, including her debut in 2008 at New York's Metropolitan Opera, the holy grail for all American opera singers. Singing at the Metropolitan Opera, a huge check off of my bucket list. <laughs> You know, I can always tell my grandchildren, if I retire tomorrow, that I've sung at the Met more than once. <laughs> it's very important for the Met to have a good relationship with the Cardiff competition. We want new talents. We want to discover new talent. We want other people to discover new talent and then seize upon their discovery. There are very few stars who have a, a superstar quality that really makes audiences want to buy tickets to go to an opera performance. And we need singers who have that star power. The next Cardiff singer winner to show his star power and eventually find his way onto the Met stage was Chinese bass baritone Shen Yang. As a stage animal. He was unready. You don't immediately see him walking on stage and singing the great roles, but he was very much, to my mind, a worthy young winner in that this bass should come up with such a mature sound. Soon after his victory in Cardiff, Shen Yang was invited to New York to attend both the Juilliard School and the Met's Young Artist Program. He did have a lot of filling in to do in terms of languages, repertoire work, dramatic work. That was all quite new to him. Certain vocal categories like coloratura sopranos, lyric mezzos, they can really get ready quite early. Now in Shen Yang's case, since he's a bass, he was in his early 20s, it's almost impossible to really cast a bass in those years. So the fact that we were able to put him on stage in major roles here, that was a terrific uh, training ground for him, where he could really grow and develop safely and not have the pressure of having to get out and simply make a living in those years. And in fact, by the time that training was over, only about so his second year out of Cardiff, he was singing Mazzetto on the Met stage. If Shen Yang's victory in 2007 was all about raw talent and potential, 2009's winning performance showed that Yekaterina Sherbachenko was fully formed and ready to go. At 32, she'd already performed several major roles in her native Russia. Her win in Cardiff helped launch her onto the international stage with performances at the Met, London's Royal Opera House and La Scala Milan. In 2011, the competition's new patron, Dame Kiri Takanawa, was on the jury to witness 24-year-old Moldovan soprano Valentina Nafornitsa's winning performance.
Professionally, I was really at the beginning. It's quite a big deal to sing in the front of, of these personalities. They are huge names. It was uh, challenging, of course, for me. I really gave everything that I had at uh, that moment. Valentina won both the audience prize and the main prize, becoming the youngest winner in the competition's history. My father and my mother, they never felt that joy that they felt it then. I mean, uh, my sister was calling me and she was asking me, what, you are the singer of the world now? You are? Oh God, I cannot believe it. I mean, for them, of course, this was the most excited moment. Valentina would start her career at one of the world's most important opera houses, the Vienna State Opera. It's an amazing opera house, and for me, like a beginner, it's a fantastic opportunity to be here and to perform on the stage. We have really the who's who of the big names of the opera world. We perform 50 different operas every year, and it gives many opportunities for the, for the young singers to show what they're able to do. When somebody like uh, Valentina wins a very important competition, everyone wants her to sing main roles. And of course she was too young. And here we can spend time just to help them to grow up. In this year I sang Marceline from Fidelio, I sang uh, Musetta from La Bohème, beautiful. Also I had a very great opportunity uh, to sing at the Vienna Ball. <laughs> It's life transmitted to 4 million people watching that program in Austria, in Germany, in Switzerland, and for her it was a great opportunity to, to be more well-known. I want to learn many, many parts that they are really for my voice, for my age now, and to really sing it and enjoy it now, you know. I really want to, to go with this kind of repertoire, and after we will see, so I'm very happy, very happy. The search for a singer to follow in Valentina's footsteps as the next BBC Cardiff Singer of the World started last year. More than 420 entrants submitted DVDs. As a result, 52 singers were shortlisted. They were auditioned at nine locations around the world. These are singers who are already well on their way to being good professional singers. They're people who are already working, they've come out of young artist programs, they're really on the cusp. We've had a lot of spine-tingling moments, you know, there are ones as soon as they open their mouth, you know there's something very special there. And it, it, it is quite thrilling. What they're doing is trying to advance their careers enormously by getting that fantastic global moment. <laughs> Cardiff is the, the glittering prize. It's, it's the one that gives you that incredible push forward. A competition like Cardiff that is widely recognized, it's played a very valuable role uh, in the operatic landscape. Cardiff Singer is like being handed the best possible catalogue of available talent. Over 30 years, Cardiff has shown that there is no limit to the range of vocal talent, that, that wonderful singers come from each corner of the globe. This year we've got somebody from Egypt for the first time, people from the Far East, the Koreans, the Chinese. I mean, it's really a really very big canvas. This competition has gone on really from strength to strength and it'll always be a magnet for, for people who are looking for the future generation of star singers. Yeah.